We're pleased to bring you the second episode in the History of Smyrna series. Today, we're standing in front of Assembly Hall in the heart of the Depot District. Built between 1910 and 1915, this building has been home to a funeral home, a fire station, and even City Hall before becoming part of Smyrna Parks and Recreation in 2014. The stories that you'll hear today are part of the fabric of our community. They weave together the past with the present. This is our town and our history. We invite you to enjoy the history of Smyrna. Hi, I'm Coon Victory, and today we have with us five guests. I've known Patsy since the early 60s. We were involved with our, youth, with our kids with the ball programs, with our senior citizens, uh, and our bean dinners. And uh, next is uh, Miss Tilly Hager, who grew up in the Rocky Fork area, and then moved to Smyrna and, and married a local guy, and has been involved with, with uh, these organizations for a long time. Next is uh, John Moore who's John worked with his parents two doors down with a local grocery store. And then across from John is Gene Ross, uh, Jean Hoover Ross, who uh, also grew up here about two blocks up the street. And uh, she, she walked these streets here in, uh, in Smyrna before we had the highways and all that. And then next is our youngest group, the youngest member, Mike Mitchell, who's 70 who grew up on the other side of town where the Stars and Strikes is located today. And so we go to meet here in the Smyrna Assembly Hall, which was the home of our first fire engine, our first city hall. And uh, John, you, you said you remember uh, something about uh, the first guy who, who worked here? Uh, one of the first guys? In, in the fire? In, fire. in, in the city hall. Oh, uh, Mr. Gwynn, Mr. Posey Gwynn had a, a desk right up in the corner there by the, by the door. Yeah. I guess that was it. But th they used to vote here. This was, this was a voting precinct for, precinct for Smyrna. And then, then uh, uh, Gene, you, can, with, uh, you living right up the street, you can probably remember some things that, that went on uh, here at the uh, uh, Assembly Hall. Yeah, we, uh, Tilly and I and a bunch of other people in Smyrna, started a rescue squad, the men did. It was a CB rescue squad and we all had CB radios and our uh, boats and our trucks and gravel hooks so we fished people out of the lake and stuff was all inside here. And upstairs we had a clothes closet that we could give food to them. But even before that, the fire engines used to sit in here. It was the only fire hall we had and uh, we didn't mention this earlier, but uh, if a train came and the train was sitting on the track and your house was on fire on that side, there was no way to get the fire engine to you. You uh, had to wait. But you had to wait till the train got off of the track, and especially if it was long enough to close both tracks. And so those are my memories of what was here. Uh, I do know Sam Ridley, when he was mayor, he had the same thing as John said. He had a little desk in there, and uh, that was where the, that's where they did all the business. Mike, you recall any? Yeah, I got a good memory of the place. Uh, <laughs> a lot of the parents got together and we turned this thing into a, a, a youth recreational area. It's called CIRO, uh, Smyrna Youth Recreational Organization, and it's supposed to tie into the fire hall name, you know, CIRO. And uh, there was a stage right back here behind, behind where Coon and Patchy are sitting. And I actually played in a band when I was in high school and that we played here. And so I've, I've been on a stage right there playing and we, they had dances and it, it was a big time there for a while. And I think we uh, lost it to the rescue squad, which was probably a good move. But we had a good time here. But then, uh, uh, Tilly, you recall, was, was a similar hall still here when you came to Smyrna? Or do you recall? Yes. It was here then. And I remember Mr. Howard Coleman being the he was a city clerk, city, I, yeah, think. City clerk, I think he was yeah. a city clerk. You paid your bills here, yeah. and he was the only one that was here. You did, I forgot about that, did And then, then Smarter started growing, and the fire department moved across 
tracks where the, and then it was uh, our first uh, big city hall, and which is the home of our fire department today. Also, in your daddy's store, if you wanted lunch, you just went back to the counter yeah. and told somebody to slice you some bologna and cheese and they put it on some bread and you ate it sitting back there. It was a destination for kids walking home from school. I didn't walk home much because I lived pretty far away. Now, but when, we, when I did walk, we'd stop at Moore's Market and get a brownie, maybe a, some bologna and crackers, and visit with, with your folks. That was great fun. Do you recall about what you had to pay for your Coke no. back then? Probably a nickel? Probably. Probably a had nickel. to be cheap. Yeah. Yeah, they went up to six cents and people just fussed about it. I'm not going to pay six cents for a Coke. <laughs> and you had to bring the bottle back, is that right? Yeah. Oh, well, you yeah, wanted that, to. There's return you, bottles you got back some money then. for them. Yes. Yeah. 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 I remember Mr. Moore back there behind the counter and he would cut the meat, wrap it in white paper for you. Uh, that doesn't happen anymore, unless it's a specialty market, I guess, somewhere. And they were also real good about always hiring us as teenagers for generations now. Some of the ones that their brothers were the meat cutters, like Jim's, my husband's brother was a meat cutter, then he worked at the store, and then Danny's Faye worked at the store, and, you know, they just went on and on. It was always somebody from the school that would did their after school. Yeah, we always had a waiting list for people, the kids that wanted to work at the store. Well, I wasn't on that list. I didn't want a job. <laughs> <laughs> I was just having fun. That was my, the story of my life. Tilly, you, you kind of grew up in the Rocky Fork area. I did. Uh, from city. a large family. Big city, large family. It was probably, and I came up from Old Jefferson, and, and it was a treat for us to come to Smyrna. Oh, it was a very good yeah. treat for us to come to Smyrna, go to Uncle Doll's store. <laughs> Exactly. Get our shoes. Yes. And then if we went to Murfreesboro, we was in Big Cotton. Oh, I don't think I've got to Murfreesboro. Murfreesboro was a big, <laughs> big, big place to go to. But, uh, but you came from, from a large family, and uh, then you, you married a, a local guy here. And I then did. I, I was thinking yesterday about uh, Mr. Hager's shop over about close to where the Bob Spivey's building is t t today. What did Mr. Hager, did he make furniture or what did he, he do? He, yeah, but he refinished. Refinished most, furniture? Mostly refinishing furniture. Okay. But he did make some. But your husband, John, did he pick up any of that or not? Yes, he's made some things. He did that too. Okay. And, and then Patsy, Patsy is from uh, the big city of uh, Cross, no, Cross Road. No, what's, where is it, Lemon? Tucker's Crossroads. Tucker's Crossroads, yeah, yeah, Tucker's Crossroads. And you then, know well and good where it is. And then <laughs> Patsy, Patsy came to Smyrna in about 1960 and uh, found her husband, and she's been here ever since. Now, Jean, you, you grew up two blocks up the street. Your it's mother and almost from here. Yes, your mother and dad was in the funeral home business. And so you can uh, relate how Smyrna was back then? Pretty much, and before we go any further, this building, yes. Tilly and I are the only ones I see in this room, but we were the only ones that, the rescue squad started right here in this building. We were both charter members of the Smyrna Rescue Squad, and we had our boats and our trucks and all of the stuff inside this building for years right here. I can go back before that. And they wouldn't give us the telephone, so Don Reese, who was the mailman, everybody knows who Don Reese was, he had to get the telephone number in his name at the, his house, and if you called, you were calling his house instead of here because they wouldn't let us have a business phone. So that was one thing that I remembered a lot. You know, we spent here and we had what? Clothes, didn't we have clothes upstairs? Didn't we have a clothes closet upstairs? That's what I thought. Here too, a lot of people don't know that. But. Do you remember the short time when, when this was a teenage nightclub? No. You don't. Know, I was Ciro, probably raising kids by then. Smyrna Youth Recreational Organization <laughs> called Cyro. And there was a stage right here, and I, I played in a band in high school that played. What year here. was that? I don't know. Well, you had to graduate. Be in the 60s. I graduated in 68. Oh, well, so see, I told you I was raising middle kids. Middle 60s. Raising three by that time. Middle 60s. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we didn't, middle to late. Yeah. We didn't go anywhere. But anyway, it, it is some really things Tilly might remember in 1950, I think it was, 50, 51, when the trains wrecked right downtown here. Two trains ran together and they tore up the whole half of the 
The reason the train station is no bigger than it is now. But it used to be a whole lot bigger than that. But we, this picture, oh, my father wrote this book, in case you're interested about that. Smyrna, the Church, the Town. Uh, Walter Hoover was his name. You can get them at the library if you'd like one. Or Gill's Hardware. But anyway, we would go downtown, uh, my brother and a couple other guys, Boy Junior Coleman, most of them, you know, the uh, train track had cars that sat on the track beside the station where the men that were working on the tracks lived in during the week, but they went home on the weekends. So our big deal was to uh, we'd get on the front part of it and we'd run across the top and jump to the next train and to the next car and to the next car till we got to the last car and you could slide down the cold car and come out the bottom and go back to the back and come again. That was our weekend fun. That was a time. Uh, needless to say, I grew up with seven boys and me. Yeah. I was the only girl on the whole block. So. You were probably the youngest. I was the youngest yeah. and, and, the, and the only girl, and so whatever they did, I did that yeah. with them. But uh, my dad uh, did own the funeral home in Smyrna, and uh, we, my husband and I both, uh, one husband then, but we were both 15 with no driver's license, and we were driving those ambulances, picking people up before they even had, but everybody in Smyrna knew we didn't have any license, but it was no big deal like it is now. It just was a, a, it was a hearse when it was, had a body in it, and it was a ambulance with a cot when it didn't have a body in it, so. But Gene, back then you mentioned that you and Jim would go around. You, the ambulance was like the ambulance service is today. Yes, it was. That was the ambulance service. Right. So uh, another thing people don't remember, and I, I, well, she won't, you won't, maybe. But the road downtown, which is Lowry Street, you could not go to Murfreesboro or Nashville on it till 1960. That was the first time it was a full street. Uh, and Tilly might remember this, because she went to the Methodist Church, right? And do you remember at Christmas? Miss Vera Cohen and them always had those chimes that played Christmas music on top of the church. Every year at Christmas time, she played for two weeks, a week before and a week after Christmas, we had Christmas chime. And the Presbyterian Church, it had a uh, bell tower. And in the bell tower, every Sunday morning, about 15 minutes before church time, Brother Smith went over and rang those bells. And because there was no highway, you could hear them all over town. So it was a thing. You talk about those bells. I can recall at Lane Cedar Mill, they'd have a whistle, I believe, at 12 o'clock, wasn't it? 11.30 and 12 o'clock. 11 11.30 and then was the lunchtime to get off. It was the start of lunch and the other one was the end of lunch. 12 o'clock to get off and at 3.30 in the afternoon, when the, 30 minutes before time to get off. Okay, Mike, Mike, you, uh, you grew up on the other end of town, which you mentioned a while ago was a long way off, which is where uh, the Kmart was located, and now Stars and Stripes in that area there. And it wasn't any buildings there that I can recall. There weren't any. Just, just your home place and your grandmother's place there. Uh, was that the first strip mall that we had in Smyrna, right there? Or do you recall? As far as I know, you know. The other one. Well, to, go ahead, John, because I, you know, my memories are not all I think, the way. I think the one down the other end of town was was the first one. It was. Yeah. And then and then I know Kmart just got in negotiations with, with uh, my parents oh. later on, or, or Wiggins and Associates is who it was, uh, to buy that property. But but when I grew up, we were the we were the last house uh, in Smyrna going out toward Laverne. We were the last house in town or what I call still being part of town. Mm -hmm. And then right out past our house was uh, the entrance to the front gate of the base. And so we, we, were, we were out there on the edge, on some of my grandmother's uh, farm property. Did, did you slip onto the base sometimes? Uh, quite often. Oh, quite often. Yeah, uh, I remember they used to drop these drone parachutes to see which way the wind was blowing before they, before they dropped the actual real paratroopers. And so, one time I was out there and I watched all that all the time, and, and one of those little parachutes got pretty close to the fence. Well, I climbed over that fence and crawled on my belly like I was in combat. <laughs> and, 
And went over there, got that parachute, brought it back, thought I was really doing something. Scared to death that, that I did it, but uh, I, I got me a parachute from the Seward Air Force Base. <laughs> they didn't come pick it up? <laughs> no. No, it was a little bitty drone chute with a little beaded bag on the end of it just to tell which way the wind was blowing. They probably would have picked it up if they'd have known about it. Well, she was talking about the planes flying low and stuff. And, and I, you know, y'all know where I live, just brought up a street here. Uh, back in the 40s and 50s, when they were there a lot, I mean, when they were still flying, they flew right over the top of our house. And they would, those C-130s would fly low enough that you could wave at the pilot sitting in the plane and he'd wave back at you. And because you stand out in the front yard, and a lot of times they'd have those um, uh, planes with no engines on, gliders. And they'd cut the rope right in front of our house, and then the gliders would go on in and land out, sue it, and the C-130 would come back around. And yeah, our house was right off the end of, yeah, a, of right a main runway, runway and, and, and boy, they fl you talk about flying low with the landing lights and stuff on. I got to where I didn't even hear it. Yeah, you know, they, we, they came over I, all I the bet time. you're like me, and Coon maybe, but not more than more than we can, If a C-130 flies over, you don't have to look up. You know yep, what yeah. the sound of that C-130 yeah. is. You're right. So, and down at his grandmother's, I don't know if he remembered. Well, he wouldn't remember because he wasn't born. But anyway, in the 40s and 50s, where the Kmart is, water would stand. Yes. And that was where we'd go ice skating. Now, Gene, I was born in 1950. And I've, I've had a boat out on that water. I know. Well, we used to go down there, <laughs> we used to go down there and ice skate because it was the only place around yeah, where you had free. frozen enough ice to skate on. That was the strangest deal. That that water, I've seen that water bubble up out of the ground when there wasn't a cloud in the sky. Because it, it rises with Cumberland River. Spring connected to the Cumberland River. Mm -hmm. And I had a flat rock down in the lower yard that I played on when I was a kid, played my trucks and toys out there on it. And there was a hole in it. And some days water would bubble up out of that. And like I said, it would be just, you know, day like today, nice and sunny. And, I'd play out there and run my truck through that water bubbling up out of the ground, you know. And some of that, some of that water that got up down there was fed from underneath. Also, I remember down in that area, we had a, a go-kart track down there one time. Do you recall the go-kart track? Very well. I remember that. Yeah, Pusher Howell. Yeah, that's right. Mr. Howell had that. Yeah, I drove on it. Yeah, and, and uh... Well, across the street before that, we had those Trampolines that Trampoline, were in the ground. Yeah. yeah. Uh, when you got on them, you were down. You got down in them, and they bounced off of the ground. That was some of the first stuff that was down there. That go kart track was a, was a cool thing. Uh, they, they leased that property from my grandmother. It was right up there, highway frontage, right up there, perfect location. And uh, Chief Bill Coverson's uncle, Mike Coverson, ran that thing, and and he had a black man that worked there with him that couldn't speak or hear, I don't think. But he could work on those go-karts and he could adjust the engines and keep them running for everybody so they could rent them at night. Well, I'd walk up there almost every day and I was the test driver. <laughs> they'd, let, they'd let me test it after they adjusted it. And I had more free laps on that go-kart track than anybody in Smyrna. You didn't crash any time. No, nah, but they'd have to wave me in though. They'd finally go, okay, five laps is a dub. <laughs> I remember it real well. Those are good folks. I really like Mike Culberson. I went to high school here. I went to uh, elementary school at Old Jefferson, which is grades one through eight. Uh, it was a four room, a four room school, two class, two grades per room, and uh, same teacher for for each for each room. And then uh, came to Smyrna High School, which was the old rock school then, which is where the Smyrna Library is located today and went there for two years. Uh, and then my uh, junior year, we walked over to where the Smyrna Middle School is today on Hazelwood Drive. I was part of that, Gene was part was of that. the first one to graduate. Were you part of that, Mike? I Are went the second, the second year it opened when I got to go. Okay, there, so you was still in elementary school there then. And it might have been the second year. Yeah, and then uh, was fortunate enough to uh, go to MTSU, to. Uh, to college, and if it hadn't been in Rutherford County, I wouldn't have been able to go. But I was fortunate enough to work across the street at Cross and Supply Company and make enough money during the summer to pay for my tuition uh, to go to MTSU. So then came back and uh, was working and, and, and got involved with politics a little bit. Uh, the mayor came down and wanted to know if I wanted to run for uh, county, it was called county court then. 
I said, I don't know nothing about county court. He said, you'll be all right. So I went up there and Mr. W. E. Carter, uh, I rode with him and uh, Knox Ridley. Uh, we represented Smyrna. And so uh, then also a little during that time, I got involved with the city council. And then uh, my, my responsibility as a city council, we had certain areas of the, of the city that we were responsible for back then. And that, that was back in the uh, late 70s, early 80s. And my uh, position was the Commissioner of Parks and Recreation, and I really enjoyed uh, th that. And so that, that kind of sums up uh, uh, my tale of, of how I was involved with Smyrna. But Patsy, she, she don't like to toot her horn, but Patsy has been involved with almost every phase of anything here in uh, Smyrna. Uh, Gene mentioned start of the rescue squad. Patsy was one of the founding members of the Smyrna Senior Citizens. And uh, uh, she got the, the people involved. Now she can tell you about how she got the, the Senior Citizens started. She was also heavily involved with our Sam Davis home, which is a historic part of here in town. Uh, she was a member of our school board uh, for uh, representing the north end of Rutherford County. And, and we still have our bean dinner every year here in Smyrna. And, and Patsy is one of the starters of the bean dinner. Uh, she's very involved with the church. And uh, we were neighbors for a few years and excellent neighbors. And so I, I can't say enough about Patsy, but so Patsy don't like to talk about that. But Tell us how you got the bean dinner started, Patsy. Well, the bean dinner was the social event for, of, the, of the year almost for a while. Uh, we started as fundraiser for senior citizens. Um, and lo and behold, if y'all can remember this, of course, we started senior citizens in, uh, as a result of Reverend Luke Dunn's sermon one Sunday, where he said it was too bad that uh, there was nowhere in Smyrna for older people to go other than their own church fellowships, you know. And uh, at the time, I was expecting our third child, and it was a pretty warm Sunday morning in April. I had on a choir robe sitting over there in the Methodist church on the side, and it was hot, and the air conditioner was just pumping like crazy. And I thought, I'm glad when this sermon's over. <laughs> but, but he did say something that, that kind of struck a, a, a note with me about seniors not having anywhere to go. So I took it back to the United Methodist women that I was president of at the time and they said, they nodded their heads in agreement, yes, that, you know, we could, we could do that, we could do that. So that's how it started. We have started with 10 members and John has a picture somewhere with, uh, with some of them. And I looked at that and I told Tilly, you know, the sad part of it is they're all gone. They're all gone. And we started with 10 members and now we have, 500 and over. But the bean dinners started as a fundraiser and we, we carried it on for about 20, 27, 28 years and the Lions Club took it over. We met in the Methodist Church for a couple of years and they, they would not play bingo. They would not, I had to have Bible games and things like that. They wouldn't play bingo, wouldn't play cards. I mean, we were under a church roof and back in that time, that was all that, that mattered. So, uh, we got to get out of here, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, uh, the house that actually Chief Arnold lives in right down the street, 100 Hazelwood, uh, became vacant. It was uh, the Nance home. Miss, Miss Nance, uh, Stella Nance Huey and her mother lived there. And Miss Nance passed away and her, her daughter Marie had the rental of that house. So, they, she rented it to us for $65 a month. We moved in there, um, I, I can't remember the exact date, 70, we started in 71, so somewhere 73, 74. And if you can believe it, I, I want to tell Chief, I've got, a, I've got a picture. We had a bean dinner in that little house. Mm -hmm. Did you come? Yes. You probably did. Yes. I don't know how we did it, <laughs> but um, it just grew and cakewalks and all those kinds of things. And this community, the Carlson's, everybody, everybody this whole communion community we have had the support through the years uh, of people who have really supported Smyrna senior citizens. 
Uh, and as far as the school board is concerned, I was on that for six good years of my life, thanks to Mr. Victory, who said, I've got something I want you to do. And I said, what, what is that? Run for the school board. I said, I can't, I don't know anything about running for the school board. He said, well, just talk to Bill about it. And Bill's usual fashion, well, you know, whatever you want to do. So for the next six years, I was on the school board. And I still owe Mr. Victory for those years of my life. <laughs> but I, it, I have to say this, it was an experience I wouldn't take anything in the world for. And I, I thank him for that. I could kill him for it sometimes but I, it, in, in those years. But... Uh, I wouldn't take anything for it because it, you really get an idea of what teachers and people go through to have to educate our children. And in this situation that we're in now, I can't imagine how they're going to have school, open these schools with this, this pandemic that we're in. Tilly, you grew up in, in, uh, in Rocky Fork and came to, where did you go to elementary school? Uh, Triune. Triune. And then how long did you go there? How many how many years did you go there and then from there where? We moved to uh from there we moved to close to Smyrna. But I went to, I still went to Triune. And then uh, I came here. Well my my we went to actually Adams, Tennessee. <clears throat> after I finished the eighth grade at Laverne. And um, my brother and his wife had had a new baby. And um, anyway, she died at birth. So my mother and I moved in with him till school started again. And then um, we moved back to Smyrna. So you, so you graduated from Smyrna High School, yeah. And then, then, then uh, I assume you and Johnny got married, then, then you started working. I can recall when you worked at the Smyrna Service Center. Mm -hmm. Now, did you work when it was across the street where the donut shop is today? No. No. She worked over here. Yeah, but I, I can recall when the service center was there, and Maybe about 1960, uh, it caught on fire. I'm going to say round 60 because I was up at the high school where the old rock school is. We were practicing football. I was a manager and we could see all this smoke. And, and I was a manager my first uh, freshman and sophomore year. So it was one of those two years, 59 or 60. No, it had to be a little later than that because I was already married and lived over on that side of town. And, we, and Jim was already on the fire department. So it was, was mid-60s anyway, in the 60s, but we could see it and we walked down there to it from that side of town when it was burning. So it was in the early 60s. I don't remember what year it was, but I, but I rode a bicycle up there from my house to yeah. see it. Yeah. And uh, the fireman was telling us to stay back. Yeah, there was, was ammunition in there and it was going off. It was early 60s, but it was later than 59 because I was already graduated from high school. And okay, but, but then, then uh, I remember you working there, and then what did y'all sell at the uh, Smyrna Service Center? Hardware, furniture, appliances. I was, I was there 18 years. 18 years, and who did you work with in there? Lionel Hodge. Mr. Hodge. And Mr. Johnson. <clears throat> and then, then later on, I can recall you came down about four, four stores, four, four buildings, and you was with the Rudford Courier. I was there 22 years, so I stayed on Front Street. <laughs> but I can recall you and uh, Mason Tucker, who was the editor of the of Courier back then, and Miss Tucker, and you were in there. What, what responsibility did you have with a Courier? Oh, you bookkeeping. Okay. I, I can recall some times during the, during the year that you and Miss Tucker uh, would come up and eat with me and Mama and Daddy. Uh, it was one of the best meals I've ever eaten in my life. Your nice. mother was a great cook. Yeah, she enjoyed cooking. So, uh, so that's what I can recall about uh, Tilly. And she was also been heavily involved with her community in, in church activities. And Tilly mentioned the 
the bean dinners and the senior citizens. She's been heavily involved with that. Then we mentioned John earlier about uh, being two doors down with, with a grocery store. I can recall uh, being able to go in there and purchase your merchandise and you writing it out on a little tablet. Well, it's, you it's could a, charge it. It's a charge book. Yeah, yeah charge book. Yeah. Then you want to tell us some things about that at, the, at your store, John? And who didn't pay, John? Mm -hmm. And who didn't pay? Oh, they paid. I went, I went to see a few of them. <laughs> no, I, I did a lot of things before I got there. Okay. Uh, I graduated in 1950. You talking about being born in 1950. I graduated from high school in 1950. That's hard for me to imagine. So y'all is good at figuring, you know I'm 88. <laughs> But I, I started out when I was in school delivering papers, and then I got interested in photography, worked in the studio while I was in high school. Then I went to work for the newspaper as a photographer, and that's when the Korean War broke out, and Johnny Hager and I were in the Air Force together. He had one of those dress-up jobs. He worked in the wing headquarters. He, had a, he, he, he went dressed up. I worked in photography. But they sent us down to Memphis. They were trying to get everybody trained because it looked like a big war was coming on. And they tried to get, going to get everybody in, in, get them drafted, get them trained. So I went down and joined the Air Force. Well, I joined the National Guard and I was in the Guard for, I think, 11 days and went, then went on active duty. They sent us to Memphis for basic training. The old, right behind the, the airport, there was a, an old Army air base who uh, lit well from World War II, and we did our training there, and we didn't have a rifle range. We had to go to the Navy base for the rifle training, and went downtown to, to the swimming pool. Part of it, learn, everybody had learned to swim, took us up on that tower. And I, some of them said, I can't swim. Well, you'll learn on the way down. <laughs> <laughs> But we, we marched, and one time they did a 10-mile hike from the airbase, walked down the road to the airways and around, and then got to the Mississippi border. We went on down into Mississippi in a dirt road and turned around and came back, that was a 10-mile hike. Then they uh, sent us to Shawfield, South Carolina, and I, and I went from, well, the photography I was doing in the Air Force is just about like news photography. It's just like, I, was, I was already trained. I didn't need to know anything about that. Then I got into aerial photography at uh, Shaw and went to Texas and went on maneuvers, came back to Shaw, and then the war kind of eased up so they started sending us home. So then I, I worked in with a couple of photographers after that and then job played out so I went to work for my dad. Worked there in the store and I did the buying and, and the bookkeeping and all that kind of stuff. And when, when the big store started coming to town, I was working hard and making little, so I said, it was time to go. I went down to co-op and got me a job. <laughs> Worked down there in the plant. Oh, in the meantime, I'd got married too. And we, uh, in 1957, we got married and rented a little old house. And, so I worked at the co-op, started out, the only job they had was working in a plant, building steel farm gates. And you go picking up steel all day long, it'll put some muscle on you. So I worked there and then they needed somebody in the office, so they put me over in crops division. I had a desk job then. Didn't like it, but it was, <laughs> I hate desk, I hate desk work. <laughs> but anyway, they had they, they needed an artist. The advertising department they 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 couldn't stay caught up, so they needed an artist. So I, they started me, put me in the print shop, gave me my own my own office, a dark room, and all. This went back when you had to do everything with, and you know, before you could print it. You know, Mike. We still you, we still do it that way. Before today. you print it, you had you, you had to draw it and, or, or paste it up. And, Right. So I did that. And then photograph it, yeah. have a negative, yeah. and make a plate. And that's yeah. the old school way to do it. No computers back then. <laughs> well, see, when the computer came along, that eased things up. That, that made it easy. Well, 
I finally wound up in advertising. And, but uh, Jean mentioned that uh, she worked for you at, at Moore's Market. You and Jim no, both? Jim did. Jim did. Jim you did. did and Dennis Fay, his first cousin, did. Yes. I didn't. I just spent a lot of time down there hanging out. Oh, to, to see Jim or uh -huh. to? Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> well, there was uh, Carolyn and Bill. Oh, yeah, well, yeah, Bill, Jim's oldest brother, Bill, was there, and then Carolyn was there, and then Jim was there, and, then Dan and Jim and Dennis Fay were there at the same time. They were, you know. John, do you recall what you had to pay per hour back then? Uh, I think they just paid them by the week. It's paid by the week. Yeah, uh -huh. I don't know. I don't recall. I can recall when I first started out working in 1962. I made 75 cents an hour, and I, I thought I was doing pretty good. And then after that, uh, after my first summer, and I was I was going to school, and they moved me up to a dollar and a quarter, and that would have been 1962. So, so I was moving on up pretty quick. Yeah. But yeah. 62, that probably felt like good money, didn't it? It did feel like good money. It probably went a long way. It did. Well, it when did. I went in the Air Force as a private, this boy that had the new Air Force ranks as, as a private, making $72 a month. And then I made private first and got raised up to 83. <laughs> and then I think corporal, I made 95. And then when I made sergeant, it was like $125 a month. Man, I, I, I had to be. You were in tall cotton, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. I wasn't paying rent or anything like that. <laughs> but also, Gene mentioned about, we could, and Mike mentioned to you about your back of your store there. You, you had a table, and you the people would come in. Your dad would cut, cut a piece of meat, but you would furnish the bread, and you would furnish the mayonnaise and the mustard. And, and we had to pay for the He wasn't the making drink. any money at that. He had just, it's freely we, we, way of doing we it. We paid for the meat and the drink, and y'all yeah. furnished everything else. And every, every profession, I believe, came in there to eat one time or another. That was the place to go if you wanted, a, if you wanted lunch real quick. It was a social deal, you know. Kids, us kids would stop by there, man, on the way home from school, like I said. There would be several of us in there in that front. There were that glass slanted in and in that door, and you could... You could see your buddies, you know, walking by out the window, wave them on in there and have a drink, have a cold drink. And if you didn't stop there, you went over to Nicholson's Drug and stopped. In the, in, that, the 50, a, in the 50s before your time, you could walk to Nicholson's Drug over there and I've hang out. I've been to Nicholson Drugs many times. And sit back there in the back in nature's uh, milkshakes and all the that counter, kind yeah, of stuff. At the soda fountain, you know, they had an actual soda fountain. And, you know, we thought we were big stuff. We'd go in there and order a suicide. And Nick would put a little of everything he had on the fountain in there, yeah. and it they tasted horrible. I think it was now, just was a, that, that was we thought we over, had to do this one over here or the one down yonder. No, I'm talking about the one across tracks over next to where my shop is. Yeah, yeah. Over, over there on the 40. Yeah, the kids in high school were there, but we would walk from the rock school down, and if, if Moore's was full, we'd just go on across over there in the afternoon after school. And I've yeah. hit both spots. <laughs> Gene, you, you grew up here. Uh, right down by the depot district. Can you recall what businesses was on this side of the town at that time? Yeah, where Tilly worked, where the service center was, was a vacant lot. It was just an empty lot. There was nothing there. And then the post office was next to that. And then uh, Patterson had a grocery store next to that. And Ms. Berry was where the uh, where the tavern is. Tavern. Yeah, where the beer joint is. And then the, the cafe was the classic cleaners. Right. And the, the uh, barber shop was five and ten cent store that Miss Blair ran that everybody in town went to five and ten cent store in the sure. 40s and 50s because, you know, you could go in there and get your five cent one of them big bubblegum cigars about like this for a nickel. And then the next place was the bright spot, which finally moved over to the woodshed, but it was the bright spot back in those days. That was a big hangout for and all you teenagers was. after the football and games then and stuff. Where the post office is now was a it was a house and it had a sidewalk going up and then it went out like this. People lived on both sides of that house and then a kind of a vacant lot. Then the uh, well at that time the uh, Rutherford Courier place one there it was Marble and Weekly's. And between Marable and Weekly's and that house I told you about where the post office is, is one of the biggest 
fish ponds in Smyrna. There are five fish ponds in Smyrna. They're all underground now, but there were five big fish ponds. And that one right outside of Maryland Weekly's between there and where the post office is, where that parking lot is now. It was big enough that it was, I would probably be waist deep in the middle part. And it was probably bigger around, it's maybe from me to John or bigger, but it had a little bridge that went over the top of it like this. It had two sides on it. And we play in that thing in the summertime. Now you've come up with summertime. something I don't remember. Oh yeah, it's there. Right there. There's no, an, I'm not saying it wasn't there. Yeah, there's another fish pond that's over here, right next door to, it was Duppy's house and then the empty lot and whoever that was on the corner. Be the corner of Ridley and whatever it is going up to the- College. Changed, College. Yeah, they've changed the name. See, uh, Division Street was, now was Church Street when we were growing up. Yep. But anyway, there was one in that yard right there on the corner, right there on Ridley Street. But anyway, then from Melbourne Weeklies was Moore's Market, and then later Barnett or mm, French they, by front, right. they by right came in after that. And then the Snake Pit, which is still there, is there, right here. And uh, It's closed, though, isn't it? I guess. A white it front, opens and white closes, front, yeah. Snake Pit. And yeah. I thought it looked like it was closed. The city, here's the City Hall. And then in the vacant lot right here was the ice house. Yes. And I'd have to pull my wagon from the house down here, and he'd take them big things and put the ice in my red wagon, and I'd take it back home. Daddy put it in the refrigerator. Mm -hmm. And then the theater. And then next door to that was the big two-story house that ended up being a library, but it was a, a hotel. Oh. Originally, it was built as a hotel. And when people came out from Nashville on the train, they would go over and spend the night there in that hotel. Now this is back in the 20s and 30s, long before my time, but I mean, I daddy them there. And they spent the night there. Then they go across town to the livery stable, which was end up Smyrna Hardware. And they'd rent their horse and buggies and they'd go to Jefferson for the weekend in old Jefferson where the all the dance hall and all the stuff and the bowling alleys and things. Well, then they'd come back and go back to Nashville. And that was about the, that was the end of Miss Nancy's house is the next house that was there. Feed mill was always here. Nothing else but this uh, train station here. Yeah. And then Daddy's funeral home was just around the corner. And Smyrna Church of Christ has always been there. Um, I delivered papers from 7th, 8th, and 9th grade. Smyrna wasn't very big, so I only delivered them on that side of town, like Church Street and Coleman Street, all the way up to the Water Tower, which was college, I think it is now, and then back down. Those are my 90 little people. But what you, paper did you deliver? Was that the Banner and Tennessee? Both. Tennessee before I went to school, Banner when I got home from school. And you had to go knock on the door and try to get money from them, but you know, that was hard to do. Do you recall how much you got paid for that? No, I don't. I know that Boyd Jr. and Denny, they del and, and, and my gym delivered papers out at Seward. Right. Well, they had, but the, all the papers came into the back of my daddy's funeral home. They put there, and we all rolled them. They'd throw them out there, and we had to go and roll them, put the band -aid, rubber bands on, put them in paper over there behind there, and then they'd take them wherever they were going to go. But you're talking about those papers, I, I was uh, in the seventh grade and I delivered papers with the Mitchells out at the base with Jim and David Young and, 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 and Jimbo and uh, got a penny a paper. So I would make two cents a day. I would make one, a penny in the morning and a penny in the afternoon. I'd get two cents a day. I'd make about $10 a week. Hey Ken, when I was delivering papers up in Murfreesboro, it was 15 cents a week and it went up to 20 cents and people fussed about Cost the extra nickel now, but it was it was 15 cents a week for six papers, and what they did, they give us a bill on Friday, and we'd go to collect on Saturday morning. And a lot of people wouldn't have 15 cents on Saturday morning. You'd have to wait and wake them up on Sunday morning to get your money. <laughs> yeah, they'd spend every bit. Of, they'd spend every bit of it, and and Saturday come, they didn't have a bit of money. You're talking about businesses, okay, there's a, between where the post office is now and uh, ice cream shop. Now there's an ice cream shop there. Now you keep on referring to the post office, but today it's the... Uh, 
Oh, it's a pawn shop. Pawn shop. That's right. Pawn shop. It's a pawn shop. Yeah. Okay, yeah. you're right. But it was the post office was, was post office. the first post office was down on the corner down there where the antique place used to be. Okay, so but in between the that where the post office and the pawn shop. Okay, we will get that right. They're in the pawn shop. And there's a walk, a sidewalk, that runs between there. They got it blocked off where you can't go through there. But the old watchman who walked around town, who was the security guard at night, the old watchman, there's a clock in there that he would go in there and he would set the clock on the time he was and write his time down and move it up as he walked around town at night. And he lived in the upstairs of the garage over there where now is the post office, I mean the telephone office. There was a big two-story house there and they had a garage. He lived upstairs over there. And he was this really nice little old man and he, he worked on watches but you never would see him walking after a certain time in the fall and I don't you remember he always always had his black coat hanging over his arm on this end if it wasn't cold and walking with his cane but he he went around town there was what year do you think that was oh this is back in the 40s yeah, that's why I don't remember <laughs> was, was he like a why was he like a town crier or something? No, he was a, he was the security guard. I guess is what you'd be for yeah, town. He was, he was a night paid watchman. The city. He got yeah. paid, but that was just one of the clocks. There was one or two on the other side of town. You have that to remember, there was no highway over here. Regal Furniture Store was the bus stop. The bus came from Hilltop, down around by the school. Over went in the front part of where the floor show was, the Regal Furniture, which is now that game shop. It was all open. You got on the bus, and if you were going to to Nashville, you still had to go back to here and now. If you were going east, you could get on and you'd go out 231 to to Walter Hill and cross out where Coon them used to live and out that way. But that's where the bus stop was. It came inside that building. Uh, there's some pictures somebody may have. It's in Daddy's book, and I've seen it on Facebook. There's a bus sitting downtown, and it's sitting there, ready to come out of there and go wherever it's going. There's one little stoplight that's down there. Can you recall some of the business that was on the other side of the railroad tracks? I guess the first one I remember was down there before Waldron's Barbershop. Yeah. Waldron's and I think it might be a tattoo shop there. Yeah, today. Waldron's Barbershop was there. Then there was a, I don't know who owned that, who owned that uh, shop that sold appliances. Did Barnett's own that shop? Mr. Bill Barnett, didn't he? Yeah. He made yeah. it right there. Yeah. And then the next one was the bank, and the post came out and set out where the street is now. You know, the, the, they were all the way out into the street, the front part of that. And then between there, there's a little alley, and there was another, I don't know what that business was that I was ever in that, but if you go to the back of that alley, there's stairs that go upstairs, and the Sam Davis Lodge first building was up there, and the, and the girls that were in the Rainbow Girls, which I was in, that's where we met. And then the next was uh, Lee, I mean, Nicholson's Drug. And then... Uh, yeah, what was where Wilson's Photography is yeah. now? That was Will, that was Nicholson's He's wife. always been there, huh? Wasn't that Nicholson? No, nah, he was, Nicholson, Nicholson was, was next, next door. There was a down. clothing shop or something there. And then where you are was a grocery store. Wasn't it children's clothes there? I, I believe it was. And then the grocery store. And then across the street was, at that time, Chevrolet Garage was in that place. And then Mr. Ratha Coleman's grocery store. And then the... Liver the Stable, Smart Hardware. Smart Hardware, Smart Hardware but it burnt Charlie. part of that stuff. Where the parking lot is, that part of it burnt, and they just took it down and made the other little strip ball there. Right. And then the grocery, well, the other one where they burnt right next door there. Then it was... Then, then Woodshed was, and the Woodshed was built where it is now the dry cleaners. Yeah, they moved from this side of town to that side of town, and uh, he would always, oh, that was Walter Loggins on that place, and he would always let us come in there after we got home from football games on the buses, I think we can come away games on Friday night, I don't mean if it was 9 or 10 o'clock, he'd let us come in there till 11. He had a big space in the back where we could play music and he'd fix us hamburgers and all that kind of stuff. Are you referring to the bright spot then? No, 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 I'm no, talking no. the woodshed across town. It was the town. woodshed. Okay. Wait a minute. No, no, no. The woodshed was, was Mr. Walls. It was Mr. Jim Walls. Jim Walls. Uh, uh, but Mr. Loggins had it before then, didn't he? Yes. 
but I forgot what he called it. Well, I thought the bright spot moved from over here on Front Street, which is where its original location was, right over there where G's talking about. <laughs> yeah, they called my right. sister Connie, yeah. and and you probably don't tell them who are. Went over there after the football games, and that was a teenage yeah. Uh, yeah, that's what I'm talking hangout. about. Well, I thought it was the second location of the bright spot. Well, it was, but I they called, but they called it the uh, the woodshed. Or maybe they named it the woodshed when when he took it. Jim, when Major because, Walls took uh, it over. Jim, Sally, named, Sally was the one named it the woodshed. Yeah, that was the woodshed. Yeah, yeah. but I can Major recall Walls. just before you get to the woodshed between the bright spot. I mean, oh, it between was the laundromat. The, the laundromat, because every Friday night when Esther and I first got married, we didn't have a wash and dryer. We didn't either. That's where we go to, and there we was a dry cleaners over, in the back. The, the dry all cleaners the base in the back. People, the, the uniforms were exactly. ironed in the back. Yeah, and then after the bright spot woodshed was Larry Lee, uh, Cecil and Larry Lee's uh, S.O. Station. And then from then on was the Lane Company. Well, then sometime in between there where the bank is now, they built a new bank right there where that bank is at. Uh, I think uh, Mr. Bar uh, Mr. Johnny Brandon and and them was in charge of the bank then, and they moved that bank to where it is. I believe it's Pinnacle Bank today. It's and Pinnacle then the woodshed. Bank there. I mean, then the Lane Cedar Mill. Hey, Ken. Yes. Where that vacant lot is now, that'd be where all the <coughs> grass is growing up. Mm -hmm. See, that was that was where the, the, the mill, where the cedar mill was, and you couldn't go any further. That was the end of the road. That was it. Yeah, you couldn't go across the railroad track, except there was a little lane that went up to Mr. Hibbett's house, and old man Hibbett lived up on up there right where the... Well, I'm uh, hearing a bunch of names I've heard a long time. Lauren, um, you know, the strip mall is up there, but he lived on it, because you go up a little bit, he lived up a little lane, went up a hill, to the top of right there is where his house was. There was nothing else up there. Then, Mike, down on your end of town, after your, your grandmother and mother and parents sold the property, do you recall what type of business we had down there in that, that strip mall there? Well, the main, you know, not really. The, the main one being, you know, Kmart. That's, that's who they really developed it for. And then there were, there were some uh, small businesses, you know, sandwich shops and- uh, Big Kroger store. Kroger's down well, there on the end. I forgot about Yeah, Kroger's was, that was our first That's about. the first big grocery store yeah, we had. Yeah, it was. The first big chain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that slipped my mind. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, that, I remember something about it. Gene uh, wasn't, excuse me, yeah. on this side of town, back over to here, okay. where we, there was a the little folk shop. I know, I think Marlou. She was where, she, that's who I was trying to think who went in. She went in when the bright, Moved across town. That was Malu little, little made fun. that into there, and uh, the that's, that's what that's what the yeah. flower shop. Little folk shop. Yeah. That's the name of yeah. the little folk shop. shop. That's the yeah. name of it. Yeah. And but there was a, a flower shop in there, so there's a cooler yeah. in the back of that building, and in the building up on the end here, let's see uh, where the post office was. They that they turned that into a flower shop after the post office moved to the other. That was. And, well, I don't know, I was 15 or 16 at the time. There's a big cooler in still inside that place. Is that when Miss Julie Mitchell had it, or was that before that? No, uh, well, I wasn't even her. Uh, I, uh, that was named, uh, what were those people's names? Julie had already moved. She was down there where the little folk shop was, and then she'd moved to her house at that house. time. Okay. Uh, Patsy, you mentioned Miss Marlou Coleman Patterson there just a second ago. Uh, she, uh, she still, you might want to tell us about her, I don't know if you want to tell her age or not, but she'd be one of the oldest residents, and she would kill me if I, she heard me say that. But, but uh, tell us about Marlou. Well, when we started talking about this history thing, probably two two years ago, maybe John Lanza was still at Channel Three, and and I, of course, being a transplant here, it's not really my history, but I feel like I finished growing up in Smyrna. And so I thought, you know, it, people are leaving us and we need to get these oral histories. So I thought, well, maybe Marlou will talk to us. Oh, she was excited and she moved to Adam's place and she was excited about it at first, but then she said, she called me up. No, I'm not gonna do that. I'm not gonna get on that camera. But if you'll come up here, I'll bring a notepad and paper and I'll dictate. Uh, well, she did. Four, type, four pages, which I 
Patch, you should have taken a tape recorder. I right know there. it. Oh, I know it. I know. I, I, it irritates me that she wouldn't let us have her on camera. I'll but, guarantee you, out of bit money, she wouldn't uh -uh, have been on camera. She wouldn't, but she has a wealth of, you know, and we are losing so many people that had that knowledge, you know. Uh, but uh, she was talking about the fact that, uh, that uh, Lane Company was the first factory in Smyrna. You know, it was over there across the tracks. And you mentioned the chimes the, the, at the Methodist Church. They were actually uh, given by uh, the family in memory of her mother, Miss Nell Coleman. And uh, Miss Nell, and uh, some of these notes, she said that her mother and Miss Evelyn Felder and Miss Lydia Weekly worked with the WPA, uh, which paid for the Smyrna Gymnasium that was built. Uh, what was that over here on? Down by the Rock School? Yeah. Yeah, that yeah. Was, yeah. yeah that the was old gym yeah. was out separate, you know. Yeah, yeah it was separate. Uh huh. Uh, so she, she just had a, huh? What did she say they did there? The WPA, they built the, they were, they were, they worked with the WPA. What was that called? Work, work projects. What's that? Work, work projects administration. Work. Yeah. Uh, and they built, the, they worked with them to get that gymnasium built. So she has a lot of information. She talked about uh, uh, the banks and bankers that Miss uh, Mamie Miller's father had a bank here. Um, his name was Frank Miller. Um, the, and First National, so you mentioned First National, I think. Uh, Norman Barnett, Mr. Will Coleman, and O.B. Coleman, and Frank John Sr. were directors of that bank. So, uh, and she mentioned the telephone company you remember anything about the telephone company, Gene? Well, when the telephone company, it was here. Mr. Frank Miller. And then if you go right up the street, right up here, the first house behind Moore's Market was where the first original telephone office was that those switchboards and, you know, where they plug them in. Yeah, the switchboard was in the front room. Yes, Yeah. that's right. And when, uh, with Daddy being in the funeral business, if he was coming over to, let's say, Tilly's house, we're going to Tilly's house to eat supper tonight, he just calls her up and tell you, listen, I'm going over to Tilly, so if anybody calls me, you plug into Tilly, I'm over there. <laughs> and that's where he would do when he, instead of staying, staying at home, that was there. Then Daddy built the first telephone switch operation, which is now not there anymore, but it was right in front of our house over there. It was a little white building, and he built that one and the one behind it for them to install all of their equipment in there. And because I remember going, in there because I knew some of the people when they finally got it in. And he showed me how the phone went. He said, you call this, he said, call this number. And so he did. And when it came in, it ran up here and it ran down here and ran down over here like this till it connected to my phone over here. And I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, <laughs> and now it's the big building there, but that's where uh, Basham House, the big two-story Basham House sat there. Yeah. And then the garage, and then that was in the vacant lot next to a Smith's house, and then they tore all that down when they built the big building. She also said that some of the local townspeople enjoyed operating it, including herself. She, I can see Marlou doing that, can't you all? Uh, she talked about Ridley and Lawrence Grocery Store. Does that ring a bell with anybody? Yes, it was across the street where she's talking about next to uh, where uh, the uh, Ridley Chevrolet was located and Smyrna Hardware was located. Mm -hmm. I believe that's right. Mm -hmm. I think so well, too. She said they delivered groceries and was located next next to the snake pit. Well, that'd be here In then. the building well, previously. That would be the building right next door yeah. there. Previously I, occupied by Byright, so then maybe it didn't. Okay, it okay. okay. So that, that'd was, be yeah. that was Francis Byright. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She's going back a few years. She's going the oldest back. one in here. Yeah, she's. So Marlou, you know, she uh, knows. And do you remember the bowling alley? She mentioned that there was a bowling alley located in the building above the current town hall, about, above this town hall. No. And it was operated by the Hoovers, but I've got to find out who that, uh, he, she said that Mary, Mary Evelyn Graves' brother's mother was from that Hoover family. Who? Huh? Mary Emma's? Uh, Graves. Mary Emma Graves? Graves? Her, her well, mother. Well, I knew it was some kin to them, but I don't ever remember no bowling alley. Me either. I, I, even I, I remember it. Johnny talking about a bowling alley. <laughs> Well, most people didn't know we had a theater here in the 50s. Well, I remember that. You know. well, he, yeah, he ran the projector at the theater. She can't he set the things up. The only bowling alley I ever knew from a long time that was around here was one of the old Jefferson that was in the back of the grocery store over there. The theater? 
No, the bowling alley. I didn't know there was oh, a bowling about, alley uh, here. Jefferson Springs. 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 Oh, Jefferson Springs. Oh, wait, Jefferson Springs. Maybe that's what he was talking I've heard him mention the bowling alley, but I don't remember where. Yeah, you I mentioned the ice house that Springs. you talked about. The ice house is right here next door. And, and that, that uh, the post office was uh, fourth class, but it went from fourth to first class when Seward Air Force Base came in. There, there, you know, we've just, we're just tip of the iceberg here with people that we're talking to. And I'm not sure we're not gonna need this group together again because there's just so much here. Uh, the the uh, Rexall drug, she said the berries came from Old Hickory and uh, that they moved back to Old Hickory, but then they came back to Smyrna, the, the people that had the Rexall. Now, Nicholson had Mr. Nicholson. Well, Miss Berry always had a drugstore there. Yeah. Uh, even well, after her husband died, I, the well, she just said was always there all during the 40s, 50s, and 60s and mm -hmm. stuff. And the jail, the, our jail sits right here behind this building too. Yeah, yeah. The jail, yeah. city yeah. jail was right behind yeah. this building yeah. in the alley. She talked about the streets being oiled. Which, yeah. What street you had, you I know? Remember that gravel, you'd <laughs> have gravel <laughs> and then you'd then have oil, oil on it. Hold down a dust. Hold yeah. dust down. Yeah. She, she mentioned that the go-kart, the sinkholes, where uh, the Mitchells lived on College well, Street. Were, she mentioned that one. Well, they were, several of them mm -hmm. down there. And she said the water, Smyrna water came from Nice's Dam. John, you had a picture there of yeah. our first police car. I got, a, I got a picture of, this is in the early 60s, the complete uh, police department and all their vehicles. We had two policemen and one car. But, but I thought before then, I thought Chief Jonah walked he before did. he had the car. Yeah, yeah, he just walked. And, and if he arrested somebody, he had to call the sheriff or the highway patrol to, to take them to Murfreesboro. Well, the only reason I dispute that <laughs> of the year being it, I was still in high school. I graduated in 60, and we had police cars in 58 or 50 and 59. They were, it was a... Chief Joyner and Sellers. We have Bell Sellers. Bell yes. Sellers. That may be the two people that are there. That's them. Yeah, but they, but they, they would come around, and uh, you know they were just in different places. But they were here. They were really proud. They were really oh, proud when they got that car. You're right about that. But I, I think they were born before '60. Is that yeah, what you're I saying? Think, yeah, yeah, I think it was it somewhere was like 58, 59, somewhere. Because yeah. I, I was still in high school when they were that like he said though uh, and penny marston yeah. who graduated with me her dad was a policeman and he always was driving a car by that time gene you mentioned the uh, fire department volunteer fire department a few minutes ago i can recall uh the volunteer fire department but then somewhere or another i thought it was across town over there, but next to larry lee's or somewhere no it was always here but anyway i can recall johnny Johnny Hager was, was a member. Uh, Jim. Jim was a member, and, and, and Frank Jr. Crawford was a member. Of course, I can remember some other people, but. Well, wasn't the siren the on a siren, tripod on the top I of tell you building? what, when it moved from here, it went to the old city hall. Okay. That's where it went, where, okay. the old, where the fire park is still now. And the towel was on top of the city hall. And Tilly probably remembers this too. But when the fire alarm went off because Roger, her brother, and different one didn't live close enough to hear that sound, hearing, but they were still in the city, Tilly and myself and any other wife, you had to get up out of the bed when the fire alarm went off, and you had three people to call. You didn't have to say anything except fire alarm and hang up. And you're going to get three calls in between fire alarm and hang up. And that's how people that couldn't hear the volunteer fire department farm, we got it to all of the firemen that were on the roster at that time. How many, how many people were, were members of the, roughly? Well, probably, I don't, I don't know either. Uh, uh, he would, uh, Mr. Carter, Mr. W. Carter was a fire chief, and I remember Jack Towns was, a, was assistant at one time. But uh, he would probably have anywhere from, 15 to 25 volunteers. Yeah, and they made $5 a fire. Is that what to get paid? $5? Mm -hmm. got paid $5 a fire. And they drop everything they were doing yeah. when that siren went off. I'd be getting a haircut at Walter's Barbershop and uh, 
somebody would be getting a haircut in that alarm or go off and be a volunteer fireman. He'd rip that cape off and right in the middle oh, of a listen, haircut. They, 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 take they, off. You, they that did. I mean, you cleared Jim the way could, when that foul Jim went could off. never hear our kids cry at 2 o'clock in the morning. Okay? They just cried. He just slipped through it. But if that fire alarm went off before the whoop got to here, he was already dressed and almost to the fire department. That's that famous selective hearing that, mm -hmm. that males have a, a knack for. And, and his uh, dirty clothes that he'd worked in, he always hung them on this one rack in our bedroom every night so that if he had to go to fire, that's where they were. And the next morning, he'd put them in dirty clothes. Well, you'd have to get dressed fast. Also, some things back then that's modern today is telephones. I, I'm really modern with my telephone, but, but uh, I can recall our telephones at home uh, at Old Jefferson. Uh, it was one of those dial type phones and it would be probably a minimum of five people on our line up to eight. And, and it would be hard to get there, especially if a, if a boy and a girl was talking to each other. You couldn't get them off that line unless you just raised Cain and they finally get off. So that was party line is right. So I guess uh, and I was probably um, eight or ten years old before we had our first telephone. That I, I, I can remember you that. Remember we didn't your have number? to. Huh? Do you remember your phone number? Uh, I think it might have been four digits. I forgot what it was. Maybe two one eight. No, two one eight five might have been at, at Carlson Supply. What was yours, Tilly, when you first got the phone? I don't have any idea. I don't remember. Mine was nine four seven four four. I was was three O J and three O W. Three O J rang in the house. Three O W rang in the funeral home. So you had numbers and letters both. Mm hmm. And, but ours phone was like what you're talking about. But it was like these microphones here. Well, the first one we had was like Lassie. But then we moved up to these, and you would pick it up right here, then you had to pack the receiver off to talk on, but you could dial, you had to dial the number right down here on the bottom of the phone. Man, that's before my time, Gene. I've got a... Hey, Ken, I remember when a dial phone was a new thing. What you used to, you pick it up and the operator would say, number please. That's what she was talking about a while ago, pushing in them things. You 30J and 30W were those. You, when you picked up the phone, it triggered them, and you'd have to tell them which number you wanted it to, to go to. And then, and when the dial system first came to here, we only had to dial nine. We didn't have to dial Glendale. You just dial nine and the phone number. Yeah, we thought when they come up with the dial phone that it just couldn't get any better than that. We were in high cotton then, wasn't we? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you, I've got a dial phone on the counter over at the print shop. And, and you'd be amazed at the young people that come in there that have never seen one, don't know how to make a call on it. I'm teenagers. And uh, I'll get them to dial their, their parents' <laughs> cell phone while they're in there and show them how to dial a number. And a uh, real quick one, real quick story, and I got this from Mary Esther. Somebody in the family used to use their dial phone as kind of like, like a burglar alarm on the house. They were going... To, I don't remember who the people involved were, but when they'd go to visit them at their house, they would dial their number all the way to the last number. And they'd, they'd run it around, but they wouldn't let it go back, and they'd stick a pencil in the dial with a string attached to the door. And if somebody came in, it would pull the pencil out, it would finish the dial and call wherever they yeah. were. Yeah. <laughs> I thought that was ingenious. I never, that never occurred. I know where Maris was talking about. Yeah, because I wasn't sure about who okay. it was. If you recall up Telefarrell's Market, up at Hilltop, Mr. Pete, Esther and I lived in the little block house when we first married there. And so I would help Mr. Pete at night when I get off work and we'd close up. And so the telephone would be right here and the door would be right here. And so he would dial his number, 459-218. And then he would put that pencil on the five and then put that cord to that doorknob. So if somebody broke in there, that released that telephone number, and that called his house. So that was his there, burglar alarm. What, that, that was his burglar alarm. Oh my I thought goodness. that was smart. Uh, I really uh, liked that. Uh, the computers, I, I don't know when the computers came in to, to our working force. Do y'all recall those computers before we had them? Golly, no? No, I can't put a date on it. I know we didn't have one at the print shop for a long, long time. John, you remember you, you did uh, hand-done artwork and paste up and all that stuff way before those Macs hit, hit our business. 
and then we had a little tombstone Macintosh. My phone's got about a hundred times more memory than that computer had. Work on the drawing board and put your, put your white board down there and rule it out, whatever size you wanted, and, and set the type, set, set the, all your type, and go to the dark room, shoot a half tone for your photographs. Paste all that down and shoot a, a those, negative. Those days are gone. I've got, a, I've got a display case in front of the print shop over there that's full of my dad's tools and my tools yeah. from back when you know, all that artwork and typesetting and everything was hand done. And, uh, man, it's, it's all obsolete. Just It's history now. Well, we used to do illustration. When I, when I was working at the co-op, all this, like, gates and farm implements and all that. We did illustrations on all that stuff. Oh yeah, pen and ink. Yeah, like a yeah. line drawing and, and You know my dad it, did that. Paste it down, things. yeah. I remember. And now you look at you look at the co-op paper, they don't have any of that. There's no it's all photographs. Oh yeah. Or, or it'd be clip art or something like that. It wouldn't be anybody drawing it. Back in the fifties and sixties, what was the population of Smarter then? Twenty five hundred? Was it that many? Maybe I was gonna tell you though, but with Tilly and I both would probably remember more than anybody. People think Smyrna was always this big. But if you were going out Hazelwood to the old Nashville Highway, after you got up uh, to where the, we're gonna say on the right hand side of Hazelwood where they play softball and everything there. And everything on the left hand side of the road from Bel Air out, there was nothing out there. The, the town stopped right there and going, this is in the 40s and the 50s and until it started growing in the 60s, but you couldn't go across the creek down there at end of town where the car lot is and where Wendy's was, you couldn't, up to his, you couldn't go across the creek. Seward Air Force Base's front gate was over in front of my house on, uh, what is that now? Um, what is the road going down there to the to the where the fire hall, police department, and everything? Old Jones Mill. Oh yeah. Old Jones Mill Road. There was a bridge down there, and you went down there. The fire department used to go in there and get their gas. The, yes. The water supply place was in there, but you went across that bridge and on into the base right there. That's the way you entered the base. And when you got on the other side of the base where the golf club sits right now is where the two big tanks that hold the fuel for all the airlines, they were there and people would have to take trucks and go across that bridge and fill those tanks up. And the walkway up here that's nice and flat when you're walking out there, that's the train track. The train track came off the spur track and that flat place is the red, the red bed that went all the way in to the bay. So Smyrna was not very big at all. Uh, <clears throat> just one much, not as, you know. Who was our mayor back then when you remember those? Sam? Sam. <laughs> yeah. Who do you recall? I remember. Tilly, you recall who the first mayor was when, during your day? Was Sam? No, I don't think he was the first one. No, they, they, no, no, the they first guy mayors, was. They the, had mayors wait a minute, back I'll tell you. Wait a Ingle, was it Ingalls? You're right. I think Ingram was. Dr. Yeah, Ingram. that sounds. Well, I, I think, think Dr. Ingram was the I first I think it's two of them. But one was the father of the other one. Yeah. Yeah. Now we we was talking about the population. While Jean's looking that up, I got it right here. Modern things by Sister Patsy Brown. The population 1960 in Smyrna was 3,612. 3,612, and it's. I guess we're close to 50,000 today, I, I would say. And in the 60s, you had to be extremely careful talking about anybody in Smyrna because you'd be talking to one of their relatives. You know, I, I knew all the families. You know, it, it was, I really loved that part of it, you know. I, I, I don't recall a lock ever being on our house when we was at Old Jefferson. Oh, we didn't have one down there where we lived before Kmart got there. Had a strength, didn't have air conditioning until I was in high school. Had a window unit. Well, we close the screen door and put one of those little hooks down on there. I guess that was to keep varmints out or something. I don't know why, what other purpose that would serve. Dr. Ingalls. Hmm? Dr. J.W. Ingalls was the first mayor of Smyrna in 1915 when it was incorporated. 1915. Mm -hmm. okay. But the uh, first mayor I remember was Sam Ridley, personally. Is that who you recall anybody before him that you knew personally? 
With who? Sam Ridley. Oh, no, I... Uh, that's probably right. Yeah. Okay, let's see. It says Dr. Thompson was the fifth mayor of Smyrna. It was Dr. Thompson, Dr. Ship, Dr. Miller, Dr. Pruitt, Alex Coleman, and then, uh, let's see. While she's looking at it, do y'all recall our first restaurant or fast food place here in Smyrna? Yes, she is. I, th I say, now, it's the first one I really remember was Captain, uh, Cap Colonel Sanders in the round building down yeah. here. Yeah, it had ice cream looking show. Yeah. It had a round building, it's car thing now, down, but that's the first one I remember. And it would be in the vicinity, kind of across from where Captain D's is now, somewhere in there. But was that before we had our... our uh, Terry's? Terry's? You know, I'm thinking oh. of really old, like, yeah. like the oh, Dairy oh, Dip, yeah. the Davis's Dairy Dip. Yeah, Davis's Davis's Terry's Drive-In was and, before uh, that. And, uh, Terry's Drive-In on Enos Springs Road. There, those weren't really chains or anything. They were lo locally owned. But those are the first ones I remember where you could go get a, a little hamburger and a milkshake and some fries. And hey, Mike, that was when they, when they finished the highway between here and Murfreesboro. Yeah. That's when, that's when uh, Walter built Terry's Drive-In up there. There you go. What year do you think? Mm, somewhere in the 50s. Yeah, it'd been late fifties, I would say, because that was there when I was in high school in in, in uh, fifty nine. I started in high school right. fifty nine. Yeah, was, that was our. But I got a vague memory of seeing them pave, you know, uh, yeah. forty one parts of it, you know, when it was probably just a two lane. Yeah. Well, Daddy built that building, and I don't remember what he had it for, but he didn't have it very long. Then Walter Loggins made the drive-in out of it, and they had, you know, you could drive in and they'd bring a little tray oh, out. Oh, that was classic. I loved and, it. We're talking about up in front of where City Hall is today. It's a car lot right there on the corner of Eden Springs and, and Highway 41, uh, where the, the castle, Mr. Loggins had it. But Castle and Dungeon. Castle and Dungeon. That's what I was trying to think of. Mm -hmm. You remember that, of course. I, I got a later one uh, that came up when I was in high school on the block right down here. It was called the Chew and Chat. It was a pizza place. Yeah. They had wooden picnic tables in there, and they encouraged you to carve your initials or some kind of something on them, but that was a big teenage hangout. You know, I spent a lot of time Bud over there. Bud on that one. Bud Kilgore on that. Where was it? Uh, next door to, it's where uh, Brick and Bread is now. Is that the name of it? Yeah, right in there. Yeah, it's that building. And what was it called? It was called the Chewing Chat. That's later on. My Just daughter, young people remember that stuff, Jane. Oh, yeah. <laughs> My daughter named that one. Uh, is that so right? She got $100. Oh, really? Is that right? Mm hmm He had a contest for the best. Well, Tilly, do you remember that? Uh, was you already working at the... the uh, well, I'm lost. For now. Oh, Daily News Journal. When the kids would sell prescriptions and the one that sold the most won bicycles? Yeah. Were you working there then? No. Okay, that, that was another way. The teenagers, the young people, kids, Troy won, my oldest son, who's now 60, won one of the first ones of those. But they'd sell whoever sold the most when school got, out, got yeah. a new bicycle. And they took their pictures and put them in the paper and all that. Big deal, too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't find it. Why you still? You think can't find it, Lord? I, well, mercy. I don't know what he did with it. Okay. He got all the way down to everybody but that. I'm about, uh, I, get, I think we've kind of covered enough for today, unless somebody else has it. John, you have anything else you want to bring up? Oh, I don't know. We may get together again sometime. Yes, we will. Yeah. There's we a will. lot of information John Moore has, yes, I'm sure. Yes. Uh, Tilly? I'm old. I've been around a long time. <laughs> Mike? No, I had a great time just listening to all you guys. I learned some stuff today. I thought I knew a lot, but I learned a lot today. I appreciate, appreciate y'all coming today. Thanks for having us. Yeah. It's been fun.